chapter 12, and at the same time, uh, turn over to John chapter 13. Exodus chapter 12 and John chapter 13. Last week you remember that we preached about the triumphant entry of Jesus uh, into Jerusalem and to the temple. Uh, Greg Wood put that slide up there. I've got a review slide. He came from a town called Bethany, which was basically uh, kind of on the other side of the Mount of Olives, which you're looking at in that picture there. Now, the day that Jesus came, according to the record that's found in the book of John, that we're going to look at in here in a minute, the day that Jesus came from Bethany to the temple was on Nisan 10. Everybody say Nisan 10. Nisan 10. That didn't mean they had Japanese cars back then. That was just the, the name of the first month of their calendar, the Jewish calendar. The first month of their calendar was Nisan and the day was the 10th day of the month. Now we know that because it tells us in John chapter 12 that Jesus was in Bethany six days before the Passover and the next day he came to the temple. So that would have been Nisan 10, five days before the Passover. You say, Brother Don, how, how do you know this Nisan 10 stuff and this Nisan 14 stuff and what is the significance of all of these things? We need to understand that Nothing that occurred the last week of Jesus' life on this earth before his resurrection, we need to understand that none of that was by accident. That everything that was said, everything that was done, every place that he was, every place that he went, everything that he said that week was a divine purpose and a divine completion to God's plan. For example, look in Exodus chapter 12. Look at Exodus chapter 12, and to set this up for you, I hope that you're there, but to set this up for you, Israel was in bondage to the Egyptians and to Pharaoh. Israel was in bondage to the Egyptians and to, the, and to Pharaoh. This was about 1,500 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. And God sent Moses to rescue Israel out of their bondage to the Egyptians. And he did that by bringing ten plagues upon Egypt. And the tenth plague was a death angel that was going to come, that was going to destroy and kill all the firstborn of everybody in the land. It didn't matter if they were Israelite or Egyptian or what country they were from. If they were the firstborn child of any family, they were going to be killed by the death angel. But God did not want to kill the children of Israel. So he instituted a special sacrifice. Everybody say special sacrifice. And it was called the Passover lamb. And the institution of the Passover lamb was given to us in Exodus chapter 12. Listen to what it says. The Lord said to Moses and to Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, that's Nisan, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of Nisan, what day did Jesus come on the triumphal entry into Jerusalem? Nisan 10. What's supposed to happen on that day? On the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Why did Jesus come from Bethany? You see, Bethany was a kind of a staging place. Bethany was kind of a staging place from the lambs that were brought, the sacrificial lambs that were brought, brought from Bethlehem. They were brought from Bethany and kind of kept there because that was closer proximity to the temple. And so Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, came to, it, to Jerusalem every day from Bethany, which is where people were going to purchase the sacrificial lambs that they were going to offer for their families on the day of Passover. So Jesus came to Jerusalem from Bethany, the place where all these sacrificial lambs had been brought in uh, by the people, uh, by the herdsmen and, and by the folks from Jerusalem to Bethany so that people could come and buy their sacrificial lamb. So Jesus came from 
Bethany, just like all the other sacrificial lambs that would be offered at Passover. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor. Having taken into account the number of people there are, you are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with each person who will eat. The animals you must choose must be year-old males without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or from the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. I'm reading from the NIV, but twilight is 3 o'clock p.m., the same time that Jesus died on the cross, the ninth hour of the day. That is twilight. Twilight was the time between the evenings. It was the time between 12 o'clock noon and 6 p.m., the end of the day. Twilight. So the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb, was to be represent each family. It was to be selected on Nisan 10 and sacrificed on Nisan 14. And so here's Jesus. Jesus comes to Bethany six days before the Passover, five days before the Passover, which is Nisan 10. He comes into Jerusalem. He goes down into the Kidron Valley. He goes up to the temple. You all heard this last week. He repeated this. Every day, Sunday, Monday, he came back. Tuesday, he came back. Wednesday, he came back. And every night, except Wednesday night, he would return to Bethany every night. And he stayed at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house one night. He came to Simon the Tanner's house one night. He would stay at different homes in Bethany and his friends in Bethany. But every day, he would repeat this ritual. And every day, he would go to the temple. And every day in the temple that he would teach in the temple and he would be questioned by the leaders of the Sanhedrin, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians. And he repeated this every day until Wednesday night. And on Wednesday night, Nisan 13, everybody say Nisan 13. On Wednesday night, he told his disciples to go and find a large room where we can eat a dinner together. Now in, I gotta say this, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he said the same thing, and he said we want to go eat the Passover together. But in the book of John, now turn, you were wondering why you were turning over to the book of John. Turn back over to John chapter 13. In the book of John, verse 1, chapter 13, verse 1, it says, It was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that his time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love, the evening meal was being served, and the devil had uh, already prompted Judas Iscariot, one of Simon, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. And so Jesus had gathered on Nisan 13, on a Wednesday evening, to eat a meal, but not the Passover meal, according to John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke call it the Passover meal. John does not. It says it was just before the Passover. I believe, personally, from studying, I cannot account for the difference between Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John, but I believe really the account in John is more specific, and here's why I believe that. I believe that because what John does that none of the others do, he relays almost everything that was said at that Last Supper. At that Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples, John tells us everything, basically, that was said during that Last Supper. And that's what we're going to study today. We know all of the Bible stories about Christmas. We need to know all the Bible stories this morning about Easter. And the best place to find those is in the book of John. Now this picture that you see is a place if you go to Jerusalem and you go on one of the tours, uh, they're going to take you to this place and they're going to tell you that this is where the upper room was. It's in the Jewish sector today of Jerusalem. I don't know if that's where the upper room was. Nobody knows that for sure. I don't really think... But let's just say that that is a picture of Jesus and his disciples going up into the upper room. So what happened that night at the Last Supper? What happened at the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples? And remember, the last things that Jesus said to his disciples are the most important. What things happened? Well, here in uh, John chapter 13, I'm just going to tell you what happens here. John chapter 13, 1 through about 16 or 17. What happens is, is Jesus gets them all in there. They're around the dinner table. They're partaking of their last dinner together. 
And what Jesus does, he gets up from the dinner table, takes off his outer garment, wraps a towel around himself, gets a bowl of water and a towel, and he starts washing the disciples' feet. Now, I've never done that. Uh, up until the 1600s in the modern-day Baptist churches, uh, in the 1600s in modern-day Baptist churches, there were three ordinances in the church. Foot washing, believer's baptism, and the Lord's Supper. The modern Baptist churches began originally as one of their ordinances, washing feet. I don't know when that stopped. You know, I don't know when along the line. I couldn't tell you the history of when that stopped. I can tell you this much. I've been in churches just like that one I described a while ago where people were feuding and fussing and fighting with each other and, and deacons were fussing and pastors were fussing and everybody's fussing. I guarantee you if they had a foot washing service, it's hard to wash somebody's feet if you're mad at them. In fact, it's almost impossible unless you want to take real cold water or something and really shock them or something, you know. It's almost impossible. So Jesus took this and he came to Simon Peter and he says, I want to wash your feet. And Simon said, you're not washing my feet. He says, I must wash your feet if you're going to be clean. Simon said, then wash all of me. Jesus says, I don't need to wash all of you. I just need to wash your feet. Why would Jesus say that? And what does that mean to us today? You see, Jesus is our high priest. Everybody say high priest. And what that means is, is that the high priest would stand in the door of the temple and the priests that served in the priest's office, they would put on these linen garments, which were very clean. They were only going to be used one time. But they would be barefoot. And they would stop at this labor or lavatory, bronze labor, right in front of the door into the temple. And they would wash their hands and they would wash their feet. Why? Because their feet is what touched the world. So what Jesus was showing is, he says, listen, you're already clean. You've already got your linen linen garment on, you're already righteous in the eyes of God because you believe in me. But I need to wash your hands and your feet so you can come in here and get before the Father. That is a perfect, perfect example of what you and I do when we come before Jesus in prayer or morning. We come to Lord Jesus and we say, Lord Jesus, here are the sins that I've committed. I confess these sins to, to, to you. I repent of these sins today. I ask your forgiveness for these sins today. And that is a picture of what Jesus does. He grants us forgiveness. He washes our feet. He washes our hands. So why? So that we can come into the presence of God the Father. Through our high priest Jesus, through the confession of sin, through the repentance of sin, we can come boldly through the, into the into the, uh, into the <coughs> throne of grace. Hebrews chapter 4. Then the next thing happened here in John chapter 13, verse 18. Jesus predicts in this verse, and actually it's in verse 21, he says, after he had said this, Jesus was troubled in the spirit and testified. I tell you the truth that one of you is going to betray me. And he was talking about Judas Iscariot. He knew that. Isn't it interesting that you think Jesus, Jesus when he chose Judas, do you think that he knew that he would betray him? Yes. He was chosen for that purpose. See, Jesus didn't come to set up his kingdom on earth. He came to die. And so every single person that he chose, he chose for a purpose. He knew that Judas would never be able to get his heart around the truth of who Jesus was. And he knew that Judas would betray him. So at this last supper, he predicted and prophesied that Judas would betray him. And in fact, Judas had already gone to the, to the chief priest and had already gotten 30 pieces of silver in order to betray Jesus. Then the next thing that happens at the last supper, Jesus predicts that Peter will deny him. Verse 37 and 38. Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you, Peter said. And then Jesus said to Peter, Will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. I love Peter. I love Peter because he opened his mouth a lot of times when he should have kept his mouth shut. Now I have that problem. In my life, there's been many times I've opened my mouth when I should have kept my mouth shut. Does anybody have that problem other than your preacher, other than me? If you do, just raise your hand up and confess it. Well, I love Peter. He was a passionate person. And yet, he messed up. And we're going to study that next week. When Jesus was arrested, he denied even knowing Jesus three different times. Man, that's terrible. But Jesus forgave him. He told him it was going to happen. And actually, in the book of Luke, he says... 
He says, Peter, when you're transformed, strengthen your brethren. You know, sometimes it's in our biggest disasters as Christians that we grow. Sometimes it's in our biggest failures as Christians that we grow. We grow from our mistakes. If you're in the midst of a, a mistake as a Christian, a disaster as a Christian, don't look at it as something that's going to destroy the rest of your life. Don't look at it as something that's going to destroy your relationship to God. Look at it as something that will cause you to grow. Repent of it and move on with your life. That's what Peter did. Let's go on. Then Jesus begins to comfort not only his disciples then, but his disciples today. And this is a great memory verse if you guys want to memorize these six verses. Jesus says to his disciples, they were very troubled. He was basically telling them that this was the last time he was going to eat dinner with them, that he was going to go and die, and they were troubled. And he says this to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Well, I'm in chapter 14, verse 1. Trust in God. Trust in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me that you may be also where I am. And you know where I'm going. And you know how to get there. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now listen, what we've got to hold on to as believers in Christ is that Jesus is going to come back and get us. If Jesus is not going to come back and get us, then we have no hope. We're like the rest of the world. But I believe that Jesus is going to come back and get me. I've tried to wrap my mind around that. I can't totally understand that, but I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to trust in Jesus that He's going to come and get me, that He's preparing a place for me right now, and someday He's going to take me to that place, whatever that place is. Maybe that room is referring to as a new supernatural body. Maybe so. Maybe it's a supernatural body of a mansion in the New Jerusalem. Maybe so. It doesn't matter. Wherever it is, it'll be better where I, than where I am right now. Amen? Haven't we said that to one another at funerals when a Christian dies? He's better off now than he was before? It's the absolute truth. But it's hard to wrap our little old puny, corrupt, in time, finite minds around that fact. So we have to trust God. We have to trust in Jesus that he's going to come back and that he's going to come and get us. The next thing he said, he says in verse uh, chapter, uh, chapter 14, verse 5, he says, If you love me, you will obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another, the King James, it says, comforter. And in NIV it says, counselor. And this counselor is the spirit of truth that the world cannot accept because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. If you're a true believer in Jesus Christ, if you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you are only born again because the Spirit of God lives within you. If the Spirit of God does not live within you, you have no life within you. So in order for us to be alive, in order for us to be eternally alive, the Holy Spirit of God must live within us. It is the gift that Jesus has given to each one of us. Jesus says to us, verse 25, All this have I spoken while I was still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives it. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. So the Holy Spirit has been given to us so that we can stay. Listen now. The Holy Spirit has been given to us so that we can stay in touch with Jesus until he comes to get us. It's like giving your kid a cell phone so that you can stay in touch with your kid until you pick him up after school. In case there's any problem during the day, he can call you. If you have a problem during the day, you can call him or text him or tweet him or whatever it is you do nowadays on cell phones. But that's the same thing, the same job of the Holy Spirit. It keeps us in connection with Jesus Christ. Indeed, the Holy Spirit knows what God has in, plan, has, has in store for us. And the Holy Spirit leads us in the right direction. What else did Jesus do? Jesus then, in chapter 17, he began to pray. And this is not, now listen now, this is not the prayer of Gethsemane. 
He's not gone to Gethsemane yet. He's still in the upper room. He's still at the Last Supper. And the only place in the four Gospels that this prayer is recorded is here in John chapter 17. Listen to what Jesus prays. Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. If you've received eternal life from Jesus Christ, say amen. amen. If someone says, but what is your eternal life? What does that mean? Jesus defines eternal life for us. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing God forever. And that word know means to be in a proven connection with God forever. Through Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that he's granted to me and my belief in Jesus, I'm in a proven connection with God forever. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're in a proven connection with God forever. And then what happened after that prayer? After that prayer, if you skip down to John chapter 18, after he had prayed for all of his disciples, after he had prayed with all of his disciples, after they had celebrated the Last Supper, in John chapter 18, verse 1, it says, When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was an olive grove, and he and his, his disciples, so after this Last Supper, after Jesus said all the last things that he wanted to say to his disciples, what did he do? He went out of the left, the, the upper room. He went down the stairs. He went out of the, the gate of the, one of the gates is right there near where the upper room is. He went across the Kidron Valley. He went about halfway up the Mount of Olives to a garden. And that garden's name was what? Gethsemane. Gethsemane means the, pray, the place of the olive press. There were olive trees all over the side of the Mount of Olives. And he went into this garden, and there he went and he prayed, and that's where he was arrested, which is where we're going to pick up next week. We're going to talk about that next week. So here we are today. We're here today, and because Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples, uh, before he was arrested, before he was crucified. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So I thought today would be a good day for us to observe the Lord's Supper. Now, what do we do when we observe the Lord's Supper? We remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. We look at the cross and we recognize that Jesus, who is God, see, see Jesus is God in the flesh. If God came down in his glory, we, in our imperfection, could not view God. So in order for God to manifest to us who He really is and who He really was, God came into the world in human form. And while He was in the world, His name was Jesus. So when Jesus, who is God in the flesh, was nailed to the cross, literally, God put Himself on the cross to die for my sin and for your sin. And so that last supper that Jesus had with his disciples, he instituted what we call today, some churches call it the Lord's Supper. Some churches call it the Last Supper. Some churches call it today the Eucharist because when he broke the bread, he gave thanks. Some churches today call it communion. I like all of those because all of those are correct. It is the Last Supper that Jesus ate with his disciples with the promise that there would be many suppers in eternity. It is the Lord's Supper because he instituted that ordinance for the church. It is giving thanks to God for what Jesus Christ has done for us. Amen. And today as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we need to give thanks to God. It is communion because all of us together share the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. All around the world, there's over a billion Christians in the world. And the one thing that we share, we share the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We're all one in Christ. We're all tied together now by the promise of the Holy Spirit. All of us who have truly believed in Jesus, we're not many churches. We're one church. Yeah, we're an assembly here. We're an ecclesia here. We're an assembly of believers here. But there's assemblies of believers all around this world. But we're all tied together by the Holy Spirit. We all got there the same way. 
It's the same Holy Spirit that is in us that is in the Christians in China, the Christians in Africa, the Christians in Europe, the Christians in Russia. It's the same Holy Spirit. We're all one body in Christ. So when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we celebrate what Jesus did for us on the cross, in the grave, and in His resurrection. And we also celebrate the gifting of the Holy Spirit that has tied us all together. We celebrate that we're all one body in Christ. Communion. We celebrate all these things together. And we do one more thing. I want to read to you the passage that we use most of the time. Um, I use it 90% of the time. We serve the Lord's Supper service. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Beginning in verse 23. And it's Paul's instructions to the church of Corinth on how to observe the Lord's Supper. He says, For I received from the Lord that I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, that's the word Eucharist, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Now that is critical to understand how we take the Lord's Supper here. There's several denominations of Christians who believe that the grape juice becomes the literal blood of Jesus Christ. We don't believe that. There are some denominations of Christians who believe that the uh, bread or the crackers or the unleavened bread, whatever you want to call it, becomes the literal body of Christ. We don't believe that. We believe that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, that what we're doing is doing what Jesus said. We're remembering what Jesus Christ has done for me, and we're giving thanks. And we're doing it together as a group, recognizing that we're all part of the body of Christ, tied together by our faith in Christ and the Holy Spirit of God. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats of this bread or drinks of this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. You'll have an opportunity to do that in just a minute. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment unto himself. So we're going to pray here in just a minute. And here's what. Here's what you need to pray. You need to say, Lord, I know that I, I'm saved. I know I believe in you. Lord, just confirm in my spirit this morning that I'm saved. You need to make sure that you're saved. Always. Make your calling and election sure. Always. I'm not tr trying to cause you to doubt your salvation. Just make sure that you're saved. Next, secondly, are you in fellowship with Christ? Are you walking in fellowship with Christ? If you're not walking in fellowship with Christ, then there's something in your life that's stopping you from doing that. And you need to deal with that in your sin time, in your, in your prayer time. You say, Lord, I confess this sin. Lord, I pray that you forgive this sin. Lord, I repent of this sin. In this examination time, you've got to get that sin out of your life. Because before you go before the throne of God the Father, you've got to wash those feet that touch the world. You've got to wash those hands that touch the world. You're righteous in the presence of God through Jesus, but you've got to get all that filth off of you. So the Lord's Supper is a time that you examine yourself and you get that filth out of your life. All of us. So we're going to have a time of examination right now. And then we're going to take the Lord's Supper service together and we're going to give thanks to God and we'll remember what Jesus has done for us. And uh, we're going to enjoy each other's fellowship and we're going to enjoy what we all share together. So let's have.